Hello everyone, Ryan from 453B here, and today I'm going to make the long-awaited robot explanation video. I'll start off with talking about the drivetrain. It's, I think it's fairly standard. I ran a 30 long by 27 wide drive, which is 400 RPM on 3.25 inch wheels. I chose the speed mainly because so I started off with anchoring this gear over here, and I basically noticed that it just happened to fit the entire drivetrain really nicely. So I have two bracing just across, and then I have a polycarbonate gusset over here. That's gonna just everything just well structured and supported. I suppose something that's interest. I suppose probably the two most interesting thing about the drivetrain, actually three. So firstly, I chose to screw joint the wheel shaft over here. As you can see, it's screw jointed. You can see the nut in here, and you can see a nylock. So the reason why I chose to do this is because that, as you can see, I'm running a. Th my drive is actually only three wide, so it's really hard to reach in here. So simply by using a screw joint, I only have to put a nylock here and it will basically be fully constrained. As you can see, the, gear, the wheel cannot move and that will save a lot of hassle when spacing things out. The other thing about this robot is that everything is actually fully boxed. Every single connection point you can see over here. Focus this a little. Over here, there's a screw boxing over here. Uh, spacer boxes over here and even on the uh, even on these connection points you can see everything's boxed so this, this gives the robot a lot of structure and basically it's not my robot does not twist at all and lastly you can see over here so if i'm running the 400 rpm drive i gotta be using 48 and 72 two gears these ones actually only come in high strength variants so they wouldn't actually fit normally in a normal uh, three wide drive. So to, to solve this problem, I basically use my lathe and I thin down all of my gears to, to low strength variants over here. I'll probably attach a video just by, right by the side showing the process. I chose to use these older 3.25 inch wheels because I don't have any new ones. So that's about all for the drivetrain. What I'll talk about next is right above the drivetrain, which are my PTO gearbox. So I'll start off with uh, so when it's on this robot. One of my main goals is that I want an A motor drive because uh, I strategize that roller play is going to be the, type, the, the, the kind of like the game changer in the end. So we really want to be able to play maximum amount of defense and having an A motor drive really helps that. So just to, to do this, I basically had a shifter over here. I'm able to shift this gear from the inside to the outside using a piston. So if it's on the inside, it will be powering the drivetrain. As you can see, everything is now linked together. And if it's on the outside, it will now be powering the intake slash the shooter. So specifically how this is implemented, I'll quickly talk about that. So firstly, because a lot a lot of a lot of holes on this gearbox is actually not like a whole number of holes on the C on the C channel, so I couldn't really approach with the C channel. For example, I think this was this was about like 0 0.3 inches offset. So to do this, I basically made a custom polycarbonate gearbox over here to make sure that I can have any kind of hole, I, hole pattern I want. And that really gave me a lot of flexibility to make this thing as simple as possible. Then specifically, uh, so I beveled the two gears over, over here so that the shifting can be as smooth as possible. And I made this plate over here so you can see how I actually, I actually drilled holes inside the gear and then I screwed the plate on. Then this plate is now driven by these two plates over here that are simply pushed by the piston and then I, I can now shift like this. Then next I'll quickly talk about the entire the robot structure above the structure above the drivetrain. So as, as you can see over here, basic almost every single thing on this robot is actually just mounted onto these four pieces. So they provide the bulk of the structure of the robot above. So to mount the so to mount these pieces, I used cut one hole one by one, uh, one by one U channel, so I cut one hole over here. And you can see over here that they're all boxed to provide the maximum amount of structure. And then these just get screwed onto the U channel, goes above, 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 above. And then I have C channels and L channels constraining them on the top as well. So here, 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 and here. And then I think another interesting thing about how I built this, um, I suppose so, what kind of one of the wonderful requirement for these towers is that they cannot move at all. The reason is that, um, so basically, uh, the sling, the, my, my slingshot shooter's rail is actually mounted onto these structures directly. So if any of these are shifting, then the rail moves, and that will cause a lot of friction on the, within the robot. So that can't be. So that can't happen. So to make sure that everything is fully constrained, you can see how every single bracing 
has at least has at least one triangle brace on here. So you can see these two over here to constrain everything this way. And over here, there's two smaller triangle braces over here. And it's able to constrain this thing from shifting sideways like this. So by doing this, everything is basically fully constrained and you cannot really just move the, move, twist the, move, move the structure at all. And this ensures that this rail is fully constrained so that it will be as smooth as possible. Just right above the power takeoff, really interconnected is just uh, my double ratcheting system. So I talked about how these two motors are able to transfer between the drivetrain and the shooter and intake. So the next thing is that I want to be able to make sure I can be able to transfer both of these power separately to the intake or the shooter. So I'm using a property over here that my shooter and intake actually individually goes in only one direction. My, my shooter always only goes back and then my intake only goes in. So by doing this way, I'm able to use a double ratchet to basically split off the directions. So you can see over here, if I spin this thing, uh, if I spin the top gear clockwise, then this ratchet is going to be slipping. So therefore, nothing on the intake slash roller is going to be driven. But on the other hand, uh, you can see my intake is actually getting driven and pulled back right now. You can see this, you can see the winch is running. But if I just move in the other direction, now, the bottom gear is slipping, so the shooter doesn't move, but everything above, including the roller and intake, is now running. And this ensures that I am able to run both the shooter and the intake at two motor, which gives me a lot of torque. So I'm able to go really either really fast or really strong, essentially. All right, so next I'll talk about the shooter. So as many people may know, I went for a slingshot design for Worlds this year. So I mainly tried this between, I was shooting between two different shooter type, really. One's for catapult and one slingshot. And the reason why I chose a slingshot instead is actually because of the winch over here. So let's imagine that I'm using a catapult today and I really want to use a PTO double ratchet. So this motor here must be 600 RPM because it got to be powering the drive as well. So this means that my shooter over here got to be running at a really high speed. This wouldn't work really well for catapults at all because it means that I'll have to basically have a lot of reduction gears to make sure that the catapult itself runs really slowly. But since that slingshot are instead driven by winches, it means that I can instead basically offset the torque requirement by having a really small winch over here. So as you can see, my uh, as you can see, my shooter actually runs at 360 RPM and is still able to drive back uh, the same amount of shooter to shoot from half court. So I'll just quickly show how it works. So I topple the double double ratchet already. It just spins this way, and I, it starts pulling the slingshot back. Then once it gets to this point over here. Its position is recorded by this absolute encoder over here, and then uh, the clamp clamps in. So now that this thing is clamped, I basically uh, to, to to be able to shoot, I want to be able to release the string. So th these two ratchets over here are actually just tension is actually tension just correctly, so that if I spin this way, so. It, in this direction, it's supposed to slip first, but since there is this thing is tight, the ratchets are tight enough, it will actually start unwinding the winch first. So as I can see over here, it unwinds. It will continue unwinding until this hard stop over here hits. So as you can see, once the so over here, once this hard stop hit, the shaft is no longer able to go because it will be driving this gear, which will be hitting itself into the, into the shaft. So now that there's going to be a lot more extra torque, so now you can see the you can see the if I just continue spinning the ratchet, it's going to slip, and now only the intake runs. And now if I simply just press this button over here, press this, it will just shoot. So that's how the shooter itself works. Everything is automated by using a task. And then lastly, um, probably the more interesting thing on this robot is uh, it's a span release. So in autonomous, we really so. As you may know, in the tunnels, we have to shoot from the half court. So, however, we're going to be shoot. We're usually going to shoot pretty close in a match play. So, to do this, basically, in the tunnels, I have a third rubber band, a third latex tubing over here. I chose latex tubing because uh, it, it it can it un uh, it unstretches a lot less, I guess. So, I'll have a third rubber band over here in the tunnels to make sure that I will shoot farther with more tension. And then once match starts, I'll simply bring the piston up. And then now, th that will just release a rubber band, and it will allow, that's, it'll, it'll just release the tension, so I can shoot closely. All right, next I'll talk about the intake slash roller combo. So, if the ratchet spins this way instead, it's gonna be driving uh, the shooter. Oh, no, sorry, the intake and the roller. So this is really this is kind of just like a complex chain system, honestly. So you can see on this uh, ratchet shaft, there's two chains over here. 
So the first, I'll talk about the roller. It goes over here from 360 to 104 to 90 RPM on my roller. And then I have a double, I have a double, I have a, I run double rollers over here because I'm able to make sure I, I can, I can get roller as easy, as easily as possible, essentially. So the chain over here, it drives this gear. So it, it makes sure that the rollers are spinning in opposite direction. So let's say I'm doing autonomous, I'm, a, I'm always able to spin in the minimum possible direction. I only have to spin a quarter. So, and then the gear goes here, and then chain goes to the front. Oh, this here screw jointed. And then you can see how now everything is driven. I chose to use a uh, polycarbonate gussets here because uh, I don't have any Versa hubs left, I think. But overall, they work pretty well. So that's about all for the roller. Uh, next, if I don't go, th if I don't follow this chain, as I follow this chain, it will go from a 360 RPM, 32 to 540 on the intake. And then now I've run three rollers. So it goes from, there's a one-to-one -one chain over here, um, 1 1.65 inch wheel. So this is running 540. And then lastly, a two to one. So I'm running a 1080 RPM on the bottom. So I suppose probably, I, I'll, I'll say the intake is honestly fairly standard. Really, I suppose uh, you can see how the, there's a pivoting intake over here. I think I did it in a pretty interesting way. So to make sure, so you can over, it's over here, you can see that the chain actually never changes tension. So this is possible because my, because my second stage roller and the pivot is on the same spot. So the radius never changes. So to do this, so also, but also I really wanted to run a screw joint on the pivot itself to not, to make sure I won't have any extra load on here because there's already like 10 chains on this thing. I don't want extra loss in efficiency. So I basically added this plate over here. You can see how there's an, in, you can see how there's a green insert. So basically my, my shaft only runs in between here and then outside here is the two screw joints. So this makes sure that I'm, I'm basically separating the responsibility, I guess. And I'm able to run both a shaft and a screw joint on the same hull. And lastly, probably a couple interesting things. I run a high train shaft racing. I run, I run high train shaft support over here to make sure that I can be able to get hit. This all this also allows me to add extra weight, so I don't need I didn't need any rubber banding on the intake for it to work well. And then I, to make sure that this thing can be held down properly, I just use these uh, two strings over here. And also, you can see uh, the entire thing basically the entire thing goes on a, on its basically own independent subsystem. I have two O channels, and then there's mount and it's mounted using uh, one pivot over here, and you can see a small stand up bracing over here. Uh, polycarbonate is fairly normal, I'd say. So we have a back plate over here, and I have a small, I have a really thin 132 piece of 132 inch polycarb, which are bent, heat bent, over here to make sure that there's like a small ramp that allows it to go up really smoothly. And then this was probably the one last thing on the intake system. So you can see how over here, back here, I have a kind of like a small blocker. So the disc is able to, this makes sure that the disc, once it goes up, it's not, once it goes up, it's not gonna fly all the way out. Instead, it will just hit this. It will just hit this thing and then drop into the uh, drop into the slingshot over here. It is this wide to make sure that it's not gonna fall out like sideways over here. And overall, it worked pretty well for us. And lastly, um, since our intake can only run one way, so for so having only four discs kind of becomes a problem. We mitigated this by basically making it so that. Once, oh, uh, so once the shoot, so once the shooter is full, this disc over here is gonna fall forward, and then it will basically drop out this way, out out, out of the robot. So this ensures that we never get a violation from having four disc, and overall it worked pretty well. All right, lastly, I'll talk about the end game. So I place my end game on the top over here, just because it turns out I have a bracing over here, so it's really easy to just add on to the structure. Um, I kind of use a slightly modified jelly end game design. So my rubber band goes here, above on the top, onto here. And then I just throw the strings right under here so that it's held down by the rubber bands. And then the gusset here releases and it shoots. So you can see how my angles are all pretty much custom, are pretty much made of just custom polycarbonate. This is done because I basically just ma just measure the angle that will give me the maximum amount of tiles possible and then just design it, design it this way. Overall, honestly, I should 
I should have probably tested it more just to make sure that it works well. And then lastly, there's this polychromic piece over here to stop the strings from falling in and getting tangled, even though that really never happened in the match. Lastly, I'll talk about wiring and electrical. So firstly, to place the brain here, I've made it. You can see how I made a I machine a custom piece of polycarbonate just to mount just to mount the brain, and how you can see how there's this like wiring channels over here, and, and the battery cable goes here. And then similarly, similarly, I just placed my tanks in the front because it just happens to just fit well. And then most of the I'll start off with the um, with V5 cable wiring. You can see how basically every since all the motors are over here, it's really easy to just route everything into one bundle. And then I use custom cables for everything. As I think uh, so, another thing that's interesting is that you can see how I placed all of my motor cables on the inside. This is to make sure that if if my this is, this is to make sure that if one of my V5 cable one of my port ever dies, I can simply just rearrange the system. I can, I can rearrange the wire, just just move it outside. So this this gives me a lot of flexibility when wiring. And then for pneumatics, uh, I place my tanks over here. So most of the pneumatics, I'd say, went on the here on the bottom. You can see, so you can see how a lot of my most of my solenoids and pressure regulators are here, just to make sure that they're really easily accessible, and it's just really easy to wire. So overall, I think electrical was, was honestly the wiring is pretty good on this robot. Everything just tucked away. And lastly, I have my IMU right over here on the robot. All right, next, I want to give some shout out to all the people which really helped make this design possible and helped me on the way. So the, the general design idea of having an 8-motor slingshot PTO probably came from uh, David from 2145Z. Honestly, this entire robot is just really heavily inspired by this robot. Then next, um, I got my winch design idea from Rathwell from 2068B. He used, uh, he basically did the same thing as me on using kind of like a hard stop, but he used slip, he, he basically shaved down the gear to down to one teeth, and while well, I basically adapted the design to use a polycarbonate instead to make it cleaner. Next, I got my, I, I got the idea of lading my gears down from Ben 515R. But also I've received, uh, when talking about how I can thin down the gears to make, to make it fit, I've also gotten help from Tyler 4154V and also Joey from 4082B. Um, next. I, I I modified my PTO design. I adapted it from uh, Sam 9364E's robot uh, world's robot from last year. I saw his explanation video. I really like this like plate shifting, plate shifting plate idea. Next, um, this ratchet over here uh, was inspired by Joey from 4082B, his world spot last year. So he is. I got his idea and basically just created this really low friction ratchet using sprockets and the Vex ball. Um, next, I got my band, uh, I got my band really, I got this idea of a band release from just kind of like three teams, honestly, the three single shot team, which I know really well, uh, Jason, 1575Y, Rathol, 2068B, and lastly, obviously, David from 2145Z. We have helped me a lot tremendously with this, with the creation of this robot, kind of telling, telling me about their experiences, and I can't really thank them enough with this. And lastly, for the end game, came from Jelly 27 27 to 33J. Honestly, I think that like everyone is using, almost everyone is using the, their design by the end of it.